Today, most Node.js resources don't clearly state what a good application looks like. This lack of guidance can lead to wasted time and resources on internal infrastructure, difficulty scaling applications to meet demand, and a lack of visibility into application health and security risks. To fix this, Platformatic has worked with a group of brilliant minds in the Node.js community to publish the nine node pillars. These offer nine guiding principles for building enterprise-grade Node.js applications. We spoke to some of these contributors. Hi everyone, I am Matteo Collina, Platformatic co-founder and CTO. I'm also the vice chair of the Node.js Technical Steering Committee, a board member at the OpenJS Foundation, and uh, a few years ago, I also created quite a lot of uh, successful open source libraries on NPM, including the Pinot Logger and the Fastify Web Framework. And all in all, all in total, these, you know, more than 500 libraries that I created are now downloaded up to 2.6 billion times um, last August. Hi, yeah, I'm Michael Dawson. I work for uh, Red Hat. I'm the Node.js lead for Red Hat and IBM. My name is Natalia Bendito and I work at Microsoft. Today I am the lead for developer experience and developer tools on Azure. A few years back, I started helping people uh, on using Node.js and I started getting some questions. And in all those years, more or less, the questions have always been the same. So, um, well, very lately, I decided to do something about it. And I thought that we could essentially write the answer to those uh, very common questions and solidify this knowledge. And so I teamed up with uh, uh, a few of the key players in the Node.js ecosystem to, you know, find out. So there's lots and lots of innovation in the JavaScript ecosystem, which is really great overall, but that leads to lots and lots of choices. And, you know, while innovation is great overall for the community, when I'm like working in a company and I'm putting together a solution, I feel like we really want to focus our innovation on the 20% that really matters for our project. And the other 80%, we want to make sure that we use just like common tools, common approaches. And I think that's where like these kinds of principles and, and even like the Red Hat and IBM Node.js reference architecture we, we worked on can really help because it's important for your company to define a common set of tools, goals, and approaches. And these, you know, like the principles can help you think about what those things you should agree on are. And also like in terms of the specific points, they make it makes a really good checklist so that when you're looking at your project, you can go down and say, well, have we thought about these and figured out what we should be doing for each of them? Sometimes we are so close to the technology or so close to the business that it makes it difficult to um, come to an agreement on certain decisions. But when, when there is this kind of information available for everyone to read and to reference, then it's easier to come together and say, yeah, this is the way to move forward with uh, a decision. Yeah. In 2011, I was doing my PhD and I was looking to, uh, you know, a technology to build my, my research on. And my PhD was on the Internet of Things, and I needed to connect a huge amount of devices to processes. But I also needed, like I was alone, so I needed something that I could write very quickly and experiment on. And so I, I started looking at various options. And uh, more or less, right about the time, Node.js was starting getting popularity. And I tried it, and it was uh, fantastic. Okay, because it allowed me to con to have to connect a lot of devices, but also the speed of um, development that of, of a scripting language. So it was the best kind of of both worlds. Uh, however, I actually fall in love with the system with the platform a little bit later 
when I actually got deep in how NPM worked. NPM it solved one of the critical problems of um, software engineer engineering, which is re the reuse of software. And at the time, this was a like this was not solved, and NPM was able to actually uh, do it. And how well it enabled you know to load two versions of the same library at the same time, uh, removing all sort of you know class loader problems and other things that were common in Java, Ruby, and Python, all those platforms at the time. So yeah, that was fantastic. So. And when I saw that, I said, no, this is going to be massive. I'm going to bet, to make a huge bet on Node. And here I am. 10 years. Been working uh, in the Node.js community for quite a long time. Probably it's close to 10 years now. Uh, started uh, working on, you know, focused on platform support, but uh, now really work all across the project from things like Node add on API to helping them, you know, sort of look at the future in the next 10 and, you know, part of the technical steering committee. I was introduced to Node.js uh, around 11 years ago when I started working in enterprise and we had all our, all our um, setups uh, for front-end building and uh, bundling and everything on top of Node.js. This is when, when my uh, first uh, experiences with Node.js back in the day. The first big uh, issue that enterprise have is um, the fact that they they are not updating Node.js. Like this is in, it, like makes no sense. Okay, like how are they not updating their software? They are not just simply they are not updating. Okay, not updating their dependencies. They are not updating Node. They are uh, enterprise software is typically full of CVs, unpatched CVs, and they don't care up until they get a big incident and then they care massively. And, you know, a big security incident and then, you know, it becomes a big priority. But yeah, this is pretty, pretty bad uh, overall. So the second one is uh, about how they uh, this architect their systems with Node and they typically tend to architect them like they used to do them in Java or .NET, and you know, but Node.js is a completely different uh, uh, runtime than those with different scalability principles, different design decisions. So you can't, you know, you you can't just do a one size fits all in in architecture and software infrastructure. So yeah, that's you know, uh, you need to take care to think about the, the difference here. Um, the last though the last problem, the, the last big problem, is about uh, open source and the fact that in Node.js, all those in, in JavaScript, all those libraries that you can find on NPM are mostly, most of them are open source and free to use. Um, but by using them, uh, a lot of enterprise and companies think they're doing, uh, uh, they're having a free lunch, okay? They're not, absolutely. Uh, you know, they, they don't have to pay anything here. But in reality, they are the last maintainer for every single uh, dependency that they add. Ultimately, they are responsible for all the things that they choose to use. And But typically, they don't behave as such. So they don't tend to contribute back to the libraries. They don't help funding the development of those libraries. They don't take care of the community that communities uh, that they are part of and this is a, a massive problem for the ecosystem uh, to the point that they even try to get free labor out of open source maintainers when they hit a bug like it doesn't every single day more or less there is somebody open a bug one of my a bug on one of my libraries asking well my client my customer has this problem can you fix it and the fact that they even think this is actually something that it's okay to do, you know, it's uh, it's broken. I think the top three that I would have would be like vulnerability management, keeping up to date with, with newer Node.js versions. And I think more recently the ESM and CGS sort of transition slash interoperability. Vulnerability management, because really the, the tools, you know, CVEs as a 
primary tool are, are frankly not that great. Um, you know, they're good for flagging something, but they're not so good when you look at it and you say, well, actually, that's not really an issue for Node or it's not an issue for my application. So they end up with a lot of things where the security team is like, hey, you have to address this. And you're like, but it doesn't really, it, it doesn't make sense in our context, but you spend a lot of time and a lot of effort sort of figuring that out. And it's particularly painful in the Node community because, or the JavaScript community, because we have lots of dependencies. And so we could have a very deep dependency tree. There could be a vulnerability at the very bottom of that dependency. But as it trip, ripples up through the tree, the, the, the problematic methods aren't even called. So like, it's not a problem for your application. You know that, but there's no easy way to suppress that in the scanners and the reporters and all that. In terms of keeping up to date with newer Node.js versions, people just don't like to update. Like it costs money. It costs, you know, even if you change nothing, changing the version and doing all your testing costs you. So people don't do that, but then that means that it's a challenge when they finally have to update because they're updating many versions. So, you know, while there might've been small incremental changes that, that might've caused you grief or not that much grief, if, if you'd moved to every version, you end up with a big, big sort of gap. And so that's a challenge and then moving up, which sort of is like a neg another negative um, feedback loop. And then finally, ESM and CGS, like that's uh, ES modules, because they're using the browser, you get, you know, some teams, some people in teams who are really enthusiastic about them um, and want to move everything to ESM, but that then breaks people in some of their existing projects there. They're still using some CGS and like the interoperability might be a challenge. And, you know, we've seen cases where you know, a module updates to ESM only, but that really causes some challenges to a project because they can't control the whole, all the dependencies and, and the mix just doesn't work for some reason. Enterprises are a little, or the pace in which enterprises move forward is slower than many other counterparts in the startup ecosystem, for example. And so one of the um, problems that we come across over and over is the adoption of uh, newer uh, versions of uh, Node.js and any other system, by the way, then the supply chain governance, um, how they uh, actually go about um, allowing or disallowing certain dependencies to be part of their internal ecosystems, uh, which in, in terms of security, can be positive because they take some time to evaluate them and so on, but sometimes it it hinders or it m makes them stay behind the rest of the ecosystem in adopting uh, innovation. My favorite principle is uh, avoid global variables. It's my favorite because I see these applying everywhere. Okay. And a lot of code, of Node.js code out there is designed to be used as globals. And a lot of applications are used as globals, are built as globals. And it's, you know, doesn't, you know, make um, a lot of sense because then the code bases start very quickly become, um, uh, you know, a big spaghetti code bowl that it's very hard to untangle and a lot of um you know a lot of tutorials and and things they that developers read and stuff from uh, from the web really teach them to build to write in this pattern using singletons using globals and you know and then le leveraging uh, testing tools that allows them to change those globals and so on and so forth all of these becomes very unmaintainable very quickly. So I actually recommend to keep the system modularized and use patterns like dependency injection by construction or uh, other things like that, okay, or factory functions, factory methods. You know, there is a lot of patterns like that to actually construct their system in a way that they are modular. Yeah, look, looking at it, I couldn't really narrow it down to one, so I chose two. Um, they're all really important. I think they're all really interesting in terms of thinking about the two that I, I sort of pulled out is like D 
de-risking your dependencies. I do see some companies do this well. They review their dependencies. They understand what they are. Um, but it's really, I do see that as a challenge for many companies who pull in a code where they don't necessarily understand the risk that they're taking on. Um, and so that that one in particular, and, and unfortunately, particularly on the supporting side, like people use dependencies, but not enough companies really figure out how they can support those dependencies. I look at it as business risk management, right? You didn't have to pay to write the software, but if it changes or fails to continue to work, it's still going to cost you, um, you know, uh, to replace it, or it may cause you downtime. And so, in, if you're not actually supporting the project, you're increasing your risk on that business side, and that's that's where we we definitely have a gap. The other one is automated testing because like for me that's what what makes me sleep at night uh and also move quickly right if you can actually make a change and be confident that your automated testing uh will give you a good idea as to whether or not you've broken anything that means you can move quickly otherwise like i'm always hesitant it's like well i made a change but i don't know if that's going to affect anything so automated testing from the start is the other one i think that is really, really i would say because I am a, I am a big proponent of API first. Uh, that that's the not the most important. All of them are equally important and complement each other. And if you fail at one of those, you're very likely going to have issues coming from that decision of neglecting that part. But um, I think that. Uh, having a good contract between your backend and your client and and having good definitions and specifications for api first models and architectures is definitely very important in the world today so if we were talking about 10 years ago no but today with all the dependencies we have on third-party providers usually and all the um the integrations that platforms tend to become. If we don't have a good API first model, it's probably going to degrade very much the performance of our systems. It's going to um, end up, uh, yeah, being very important, very difficult to connect part different parts of the system. And we're going to end up doing twice as much work or three times as much or four or whatever exponentially more times the work that we could have saved if we had a good specification in the middle yeah thanks for watching follow the link to read the pillars